and how to let go and to let be. That's our theme. And we are in discourse number three. So we want to start out with Matthew 19. Uh, some, as you see in the New Testament, if there is something about having and being, and what Jesus says about having and being. And I will find it. It is Matthew 19. I have it here. And here's a story, and we want to look at a little bit. The, um, they are similar. Jesus is concerned with this having and being in the source queue. There is before Matthew and before Luke, there is a source queue which got lost. But they share this source. So when they wrote, they had this before themselves queue which is lost. And there was an older queue which goes to the oldest times of the Christian community, Jesus himself. And there was a newer queue, a newer source, which was a little bit later, but still very, very early. So, and so one of these stories there is, and we all know it, but we want to look at this with a little bit more reflection than usually. Uh, a rich young man there, Matthew 19. And there was a man who came to him and asked, Master, what good deed must I do to possess eternal life? So that is a central thing. And eternal life and the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are all the same. So to be a member of the kingdom of God means also to have eternal life. We are all mortal. We all must die. That is a necessary law which we have in common with all other living things on this earth. And um, so there is now this hope which makes really man man, this longing uh, that there may be more than this world of appearances, that there may be this longing for unconditional love which we do not find in finite history, or this long for perfect justice which we don't find. So. It is this, it is not the hammer or the screwdriver or whatever, the invention that, which makes us human in our evolution. But when this longing came up, so about 200,000 years ago, people began to bury people and put food there. That tells us that they, or they made paintings uh, carved into the wall and so on. So the beginning of art, the beginning of religion is rooted in that longing that this fellow there, or this pharaoh, or whoever died, that that may not be the last thing. No animal has this. An elephant may get a little sad when somebody dies. Animals do have feelings, and uh, but we can think. And it is this thinking. Thinking is transcending. Thinking means transcending. Thinking means to long for something more than, or the hope that the world of appearances, with all its injustices, which we cannot adequately deal with, that this may not be the last word. The longing that the murderer shall ultimately not triumph over the innocent victim, in spite of the fact that he triumphs all the time in terms of our experiences. But this hope, that makes us human. Hello, there we have two more friends coming. Wonderful. Oh, you found us. That is good. So then, so there, Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only this one alone who is good. That means the Father in heaven is good. That is very important now for the humanity. Uh, that is not the right thing. Excuse me, sir. Let me see if I have. David, uh, Jesus. Maybe there we have one more. Yeah, okay. See, I didn't know we were so many tonight. You're so popular today. Yes, we are getting more and more popular. That's wonderful. <laughs> so uh, there is alone, there is one alone who is good. So um, Jesus says, don't call me good. And for Catholics or Orthodox with the high Christology, that is very important. Uh, Jesus never calls himself the Son of God or God or only the son of man, which comes from Daniel. That is the only title he uses for himself. So there is one alone who is good, don't call me good, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Uh, he said, which these, Jesus replied, you must not kill. That always comes first in Jesus' statements. 
you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not bring false witness, honor your father and mother, and you must love your neighbor because he is you. That is the real translation. They translate so very often wrong there. So love your neighbor because he is like you. So then um, the young man said to him, I have kept all these. That's a little bit funny because he's very rich without stealing. That is, uh, <laughs> that is unusual. How one can get rich without stealing. But um, Aristotle, Plato, and uh, Jesus, and Socrates can be compared. They lived in different cities, in different states, but they both were executed by the state, and they both upset the ruling group where they were, and finally they had a trial, and so there are some similarities. <laughs> and um, so, they, But they did not know in Jerusalem, or in Rome, or in Athens, how one gets rich. They thought the wealth comes from God or whatever. That means they were not aware that work was the source of their wealth and that the slaves produced the wealth. And so and the slaves were not even considered to be human. So uh, uh, that is interesting. So Jesus uh, does not have a real economics or whatever, but he is like so many people in antiquity, not fully aware that uh, in order to get rich, you cannot get rich by your own work. You have, in one form or the other, you have to appropriate the surplus value of others. That is what makes you rich. And that is what slaveholders and feudal lords and capitalists have in common, the appropriation of surplus value. So in one of my students' works here in the restaurant, <laughs> she um, produces maybe $100 on Monday, she gets 25 or something like that. That's uh, just some numbers. And the $75, uh, that is surplus value from which, of course, the owner has to pay the rent and the electricity and, and all kinds of things. So but all my cleaning people who clean my house, so I pay them uh, $12 or something like that, and uh, I pay, no, I pay $120, and each of them gets $12 and $24. So the rest is surplus value, except the owner has to pay for the car and for the chemicals and things like that. So really it goes down then to $50 or $40, whatever it is. But that is the surplus value. The accumulation of that, the more people you work for you, uh, the richer you get, of course. But this is not clear for people in antiquity and not even, I think, from, from the Middle Ages. But it is very clear to modern people. So a young man said to him, I have kept all these. What more do I need to do? Jesus said, if you wish to be perfect, go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor. That is this having and being. You can come into being, into life, into eternal life, into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, only if you change from the having attitude to the being attitude, from the having structure to the being structure, from the having mode to the being mode. That is very powerful and very radical. Uh, in already with the Hebrew Bible and in the Holy Quran and also in the New Testament. Okay, so that's a fundamental requirement. And when we look, you know, people's money or whatever, we'll see that our society turns that upside down. That means having is in the foreground, having, having, having all the time. And uh, the less one is, the more one has, or one replaces what one is not by having or so. And then Eric Fromm, we mentioned already, psychoanalyst in New York and so on, who found out that this is the basis of many illnesses. The having mode leads to insanity, the being mode leads to sanctity. So this is uh, one story here. There are many, many of these stories. Also, even the church fathers later on continue this. So uh, Jesus, if you wish to perfect, be perfect, go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And but when the young man heard these words, he went away sad, for he was a man of great wealth. And we have to see here that Jesus, of course, belonged to the lower classes. Um, <coughs> this fellow belongs to what we call the middle class. Um, and so there is a class difference. We will talk about this later on. And then, then Jesus said to his disciples, so the young man goes away, and Jesus talks to his disciples, I tell you solemnly, 
it will be hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So when you have this having mode, you simply cannot make it. No eternal life. That means the rich have their consolation already. The, um, the, and then, yes, I tell you again, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And there was no way that a camel could go through that little door which was called the needle in the walls of Jerusalem. There was where the big doors were closed. There was a little door where the lovers could walk through there when they had a date outside the walls. Then they sneaked through that little thing, but they had to crawl on all four legs and no camel could possibly go through this little door. So when the disciples heard this, they were astonished. <coughs> were astonished. Why they were astonished? That's another question. They owned a little bit. They owned a boat. And by the way, the having mode cannot completely be cancelled. Even in the Hebrew Bible, we'll see to have a tent, for instance, or to have a camel or whatever, is not considered to be the having mode. You have to have something to eat, to drink, to clothing, and some kind of a, of a place where you can sleep or whatever. So, but they were astonished. Um, uh, who can be saved then? And the answer is, well, that is a funny question because it presupposes that all are rich and therefore all, nobody can be saved. But, so obviously his disciples had no clear vision that the society was antagonistic, that they were masses of poor people and only a few were rich. So they could have asked, okay, the few rich, they will not make it. But the many poor, they will make it. So, but the, um, the difference between Socrates and Jesus is that Socrates had highly educated, sophisticated Athenians, and uh, Jesus' disciples came from the province, from Galilee. They were not without, with one exception, uh, that was Judas Ishkariot, the man from Kariot, which was a suburbs of a suburb of Jerusalem, and he managed the money because he was probably the only one who could count right. <laughs> he said, Jesus gazed at them. That is an always a wonderful expression there. So he looks at them very sharply. He gazed at them. For men, he told them, this is impossible. For God, everything is possible. So there is the possibility even for a man who has this having attitude to be saved because God could even turn such a guy around. Then, the, then Peter spoke, so he's the leader of the group. Fisherman, what about us, he said to him. We have left everything and followed you. What are we to have then? Jesus said to him, I tell you solemnly, when all is made new, here is the issue which we will read the last thing next week. That means the, the most Christian of all words is, see, I shall make all things new. That means uh, Christianity is desperate in that sense that the world which has been created is beyond repair. That means it cannot really improve, improve. So therefore the new heaven and the new earth is the promise of Christianity. It stands and falls with this. And then the parousia delay, of course, that it does not happen, that the Messiah has not returned in 2,000 years and for the Jews not for 2,800 years, and for the Muslims not uh, to 1,600, 1,400 years, and so on. So that is the most painful open flank of all three Abrahamic religions into which every liberal, every agnostic, every atheist can drive with his big tanks. So I tell you, Jesus says, I tell you solemnly, when all is made new, and the Son of Man, here he calls himself the Son of Man, but this could also not be him. There may be another one or so, but we leave it here as it is. Son of man sits on his throne of glory. You will yourself sit on 12 thrones to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. The, of course, only two were still present. The other tribes, the 10 tribes, got lost. That means the northern tribes, they were taken to, into Babylon and there they were not settled together, but they were spread all over the territory, the Euphrates and Tigris, and they were sucked up by the, uh, 
by the population there. So that is always the danger why the rabbis here, we go, I take my class to a rabbi on Thursday, why the rabbis are so furiously against intermarriage. That means there's always uh, the danger that they will be assimilated. Assimilated biologically and also assimilated then, of course, in terms of the faith, that the faith gets lost in mixed marriages and so on. That is a great fear. And even, of course, the Orthodox rabbi, but even the conservative rabbi will have the same opinion. And even the, uh, the reformed rabbi, which is the most liberal one, who makes all kinds of deals with modernity, he will be open for blessing homosexual unions, but he will not allow mixed marriages because it is something which goes to the very substance of the Jewish people in the diaspora. So, uh, <coughs> and everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, children, or land, for the sake of my name, will be repaid a hundred times over and also inherit eternal life. So here is what belongs to the uh, possession or the, the uh, possessive type of uh, personality, the uh, having type of personality. What one can have is one can have houses and brothers and families and, and, and all these things. But we have to be careful that we don't become abstract. So we want to say right away the being attitude needs a minimum at least of the having attitude. But if you have an, in, enough to eat or a tent or a tabernacle, as this is called, we'll get to this later on, um, that minimum, that is granted. So, but uh, there is a, a main abs accent on being rather than having. So this shows us what the New Testament has to say in a very early stage. Many who are first will be last, and the last first. So those who are rich, they are first now, they will be the last. Those who are the last, the lowest classes, they will be the first. And that is a revolutionary message. So uh, Christianity in its origin is rebellious. It is revolutionary. You can hardly notice that if you go into a bourgeois parish here, yeah, because these revolutionary elements have been extirpated. They have been taken out of it. It has become harmless. So when you read uh, your father Ken, for instance, he would say, well, that was a little bit these early Christians there, that they sold everything and gave it to Peter. So this is an idealization. <laughs> Suddenly they become, they become critical of the New Testament. So that has something to do with how Christianity has been transformed, particularly after it became a state religion in the Roman Empire. <coughs> but even after it stopped to be a state religion in the United States, the first great experience, a state without religious legitimation, um, then in civil society, it was not connected now with the state, who pays the state church, but rather with the rich, who, uh, and so the churches all around here, they are all owned by somebody who has to pay them so that they don't get into the red, and the heating system is paid and all this, but, you know, the rich don't pay the churches for nothing. So, and then the price which has to be paid is that this revolutionary element is taken out of it, uh, all of it. <coughs> so the, uh, you have a wonderful story, Dostoevsky wrote these stories and so on, um, where the uh, Jesus comes and uh, he meets the great inquisitor uh, who has taken the freedom away from people. Um, and Jesus comes and looks at him and then Jesus weeps and he goes away. So he does not, all these people who took the freedom away or the revolutionary element out of it, Jesus will not necessarily curse him, he will rather weep about them. So it's a beautiful, Dostoevsky is one of the greatest uh, Christian writers. He was orthodox and, uh, and a socialist at the same time. Also Tolstoy had similar tendencies. Okay, so this is uh, our story for tonight <laughs> as a background so that we know how in the New Testament the being and having, how that is differentiated. Okay, we want to look at shortly at the time diagnosis. We promised that to us. We want to look at something which happened. And there are things happening which uh, have something to do with our theme. Um, Chicago, the one murder after the other, and then there was the uh, Christopher um, Dorner case, and so on, and all that would be worthwhile uh, to see how far it is symptomatic for a heavy type of a society. 
but we want to take something closer to home. Um, we want to discuss very shortly an article uh, on the resignation of Benedict the Sixteenth in the Kalamazoo Gazette. Maybe you have seen it, um, and to see how that has something to do with uh, our theme here. So I brought it here, and you can all get it on the, on the website there. But it was Ursula Cirelli, which is one of our reporters, and she called me up last week and um, in order to know what I think about the Pope's resignation. And she also called the bishop. So you have the two parts there. One is about the bishop, and the other one is what I said. And um, the, the, t the title is Kalamazoo Theologians Say Courage and Conflict Motivate Move to Step Down uh, uh, Pope Resigns, and so on. So, <coughs> and I just want to look at some of these things. So Bishop, uh, bishop uh, Paul Bradley, the Catholic Diocese of Kalamazoo says the resignation of Pope Benedict XVI is another sign of his tremendous humility and great wisdom. Why humility? Uh, obviously because Pope Papal office is a very high office and now is humble and he humbles himself. He always did that. He said he was the donkey of God, so which had to carry all the burden and uh, now obviously the burden became too heavy and the donkey is now resigning. So, but the question is why it became so heavy. And there is where the bishop and I, where we are a little bit of different opinion. So why it was great wisdom, that we don't know the reason for that neither. So, um, but religious critics of the Pope, now that's me, such as Western Michigan University comparative religion professor Olaf Siebert, say the move could come as a result of the mounting pressures of a modernity weighing on Catholicism. <coughs> so there you have two views, and both can be right and, and uh, can come to an agreement. But uh, what is it really? Um, I think we have to look at all world religions as uh, threatened by the modernization process. It didn't happen yesterday. It was there before um, people settled North America already and started in Europe, um, where the religion and, uh, and the secular world were not only differentiated, that happened everywhere. Already in tribal societies, you have uh, some of what they do is secular for fishing in the Lagune, and some of it is, uh, uh, becomes religious when they go out in the open sea and they cannot handle it anymore. Then they have the ballooners and the spirits who help them and so on. So, but what happens uniquely the first time in the West, in that little Europe, in this little peninsula of Asia, there, there uh, um, something happened which had never happened before. There was a beginning of modernity in China for a short time when they invented the gunpowder, but they mainly used it for a New Year's celebration or whatever. There was a little beginning of modernity in Greece when they invented the steam engine but they could never put it into the landscape. They played with it, but uh, they couldn't use it because there were too many guards sitting on bridges and rivers and so on. They could never have driven freely. They would have to stop at a moment and make a sacrifice to some kind of a god or whatever. <coughs> but um, there was also the printing press in China and so on. So uh, little indications that it could have become modern, but it, um, it didn't take off. It didn't take off. So, um, but it did. In the 14th, 15th century, uh, the, when the last pope uh, resigned, um, the, uh, then it took off in the West. And um, if this had to happen, or happened with necessity, that's another question. But it started with burning of Giordano Bruno. Uh, the Holy Inquisition burned people alive. And Giordano Bruno was one of the first modern people to whom that happened. Um, it could have happened to Luther, he would also have been burnt if not the Prince of Thuringia would have uh, rescued him. Um, so it, uh, Galileo was threatened with waterboarding, waterboarding which the CIA is using still, um, <coughs> comes from the SS, the German SS, Nazi uh, intelligence services, and they got it from the Holy Inquisition. So that's a bad inheritance, I would say. The, the issue is you can have a good purpose, and the Inquisition had a good purpose. They wanted to keep Christianity together. They wanted to preserve the unity of the faith. And, uh, but when you have a means, that means a good goal does not sanctify the means, a bad means. 
That is a fundamental principle and uh, the bad means is not only morally bad, it is also instrumentally bad because the killing which the Inquisition did, did ultimately contribute to the splitting of Christianity. That means the Reformation was not a real reformation of the Church, but it was a disintegration of Christianity in 1,200 groups in this country. That is absolute madness. I know that my Protestant, Protestant brothers are sad when I say these things, and I gave a speech once a long time ago at K College, and um, I talked about the unity that Jesus said, you should be one, like the Father and I are one, and we aren't. And uh, so they thought I shouldn't say this, but um, it is true that Christianity has disintegrated and that from an external point of view, in terms of the interpretation of reality and particularly the orientation of action, moral issues, all these groups are uh, uh, different from each other and contrary, if you want to have an abortion in Borges Hospital, you cannot get it. They put you in a taxi and take you over to Bronson Hospital. The same thing is with birth control and so on. So the Christian groups, uh, one is Methodist, the other one's Catholic, and they don't uh, agree uh, on much. That is, uh, weakens, of course, Christianity as well. So, but nevertheless, what I mean here is that this modernity has happened, and this antagonism, the deeper it became, and it is getting deeper all the time. Obama has just uh, promised billions of dollars for brain research and so on. There you have the Galileo case going on and on and on, particularly Obama also stem cell research. He openly pays for stem cell research. So he goes totally the this, this scientific way, um, uh, step by much more than Bush did before and so on. So, but that is the general trend. But let me repeat again that when, when something is moral, morally bad, it may also be instrumentally bad. And that happened to the Inquisition. Uh, but it happened also in terms of Bush's torture. Very often you get the wrong information. Um, when you torture somebody and uh, put water, you put water on his face and he has the feeling he's dying and so on. In order to get out of this, he will say anything. And so what you get in the end is utter, utter misinformation and, and not real information. I was under investigation when I was a prisoner of war in Norfolk. And the FBI people were all Jewish people from, uh, from Germany who had all the reasons to take revenge or whatever. But nobody ever used torture. If you're intelligent enough, you don't have to use torture. You can use means which are moral and are much more adequate. They had cross hearings, and in these cross hearings they could say exactly where you were, at what time, and what you did. So one of my comrades there, he had driven a truck in Poland it was Christmas 1941, and they pieced it all together, and who was on the truck, and where did you go? Into a quarry, and suddenly there were the Jews on the truck, and the quarry, they were shot in the quarry, and so on. So then they knew he was a fascist, and he was a war criminal, and so on. So in my case, they found out that I was in the youth movement, Catholic youth movement in Frankfurt, and we had spread von, von Galen's sermons, uh, and the Gestapo was after us, and we had helped Jews, and we kept them in the basement, and, and so then I was made an anti-Nazi, and so on. But all these pressures, and so on, uh, were done, you know, in maybe in a psychological sense, but not in a torturous sense, really. It can be done. <coughs> okay, so, but the deeper this antagonism uh, happened, the more also the religious communities split in themselves. So I just mentioned the Jews, uh, on one side the Orthodox and then the Reformed. <coughs> that means some of the believers believe they have to hold on to the holy text there, word by word and, and so on, and, uh, and emphasize their identity and, and authority and tradition. And the other side said, well, we want to have our Jewish or Christian or Islamic identity too, but we also want to open up for modernity. Um, and this is possible. So you have then on one side Benedict the Sixteenth, um, whom they call in Europe our Taliban, um, because the Taliban have this integrity type of uh, position in Islam. And then you have on the other hand, and they are mentioned here, my good friends, the Hans Küng and Baptist Metz uh, on the other side, who think that one can be a Christian 
and one can be modern at the same time. Um, the, um, uh, if you uh, take the fundamentalist position, identity and so on, then you get uh, more and more into, into hypocrisy. You, on one side, are against modernity, and Benedict XVI made an outright war in the last seven years against modernity. But then you go to a hospital and you have a heart transplantation and you fly in a beautiful airplane or a post-pope mobile or whatever. Mm -hmm. And these are accomplishments of, uh, of modernity and so on. So on one side you condemn them all and the other side you, uh, um, you, know, you, are, you, you use them and so on. So that is not good for the soul, of course. So <clears throat> that is the, the issue. So what I practically say is that the Pope in this constellation, in this antagonism, took a course or used a paradigm which led to an aporia, that means into a dead end street, and that is why he had to resign. What does that mean? The paradigm according to which Roman Catholicism operated in modernity was Thomas Aquinas. It was scholasticism. And up to the Second Vatican Council, this, uh, this scholasticism uh, was the right way to go, and Catholics knew what to say, the natural law and all this. And we had uh, Mariton here in, in Toronto, and from him, from this continual scholasticism, we got our medieval institute here, and so on. So in the 30s and 40s, this uh, scholastic, neo-scholasticism was in the foreground, and then with the Vatican Council it collapsed. And that part, uh, uh, it, it collapsed because it was built on Aristotle and Aristotelian uh, psychology and biology and has been put into question. The whole principle of teleology, of purposiveness, was put into question all in the 17th century. And so also the Aristotelian metaphysics, therefore, was not adequate anymore. And scholasticism became drier and drier and uh, less and less uh, convincing, in spite of the fact that it went on to teach in the seminars and so on. So, when the council took place, the, uh, one had to find a new paradigm in which uh, the Catholics could be united and could take positions and morality and so on. And so the uh, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, Josef Ratzinger, and it says here, I knew him, um, was a professor in Tübingen, and um, he had concentrated not on the Middle Ages but on antiquity. That means he was a pat, pa, uh, patristic professor. Patristic means he was concerned with the church fathers. They are the Greek church fathers and they are the Roman church fathers. And uh, so he studied both of them. So Origenes is a Greek church father who is the founder of the orthodox paradigm of Christianity. And Augustine is a Latin church father and he was responsible for the initiation of the Roman Catholic paradigm. So. Um, but so instead of taking Thomas Aquinas now, who was Aristotelian, and who rescued us from Islam, uh, because by a thousand or so, um, the Islamic civilization in North Africa and the Near East was blooming, and also their philosophy was blooming, and all the, uh, as the Muslim thinkers were all Aristotelians. And they transformed the Holy Quran into an Aristotelian form. In order to think, you have to have some kind of a, a logic and so on. So, and thereby they threatened Christianity, particularly Paris was the center of Christian thinking. And uh, in this disaster, it was Thomas Aquinas then who read Averroes, one of the great Arabic Aristotelians, and uh, he uh, learned from him and did the same thing to Christianity, namely shifted from a Platonic interpretation of Christianity to an Aristotelian one. That rescued Christianity at that moment. Um, uh, Thomas, like all the other great thinkers, was under heresy suspicion for a short time, but later on they, they changed their mind. So, uh, so that suddenly he said, well, not the Inquisition was wrong, but Galileo was wrong. And that more than Giordano Bruno in too, and his burning, and hundreds of others, and so on. So he messed it all up, and he could not go anymore. He could not go to the university, and they didn't want to see him at all because of this position. <coughs> and how one, uh, how one deals with these things is that one <coughs> looks really at the argumentation of the inquisitors, 
they have a right to be heard too. So one cannot simply say, I hate the Inquisition, I will not listen to that thing. They, we said already that the Inquisition had a good purpose. There's nothing wrong with following the New Testament and keeping Christianity together. Uh, but the means which they used were criminal, and therefore they were not adequate, and they did the opposite. They were utterly counter counterproductive. So, but the, uh, uh, the Inquisition were not simply uh, stupid people. Uh, also, Galileo's argument, uh, Galileo was old. He was already in 70 when he was dragged before the Inquisition, and that he was old and was very famous in Europe and so on, that messed it all up for the Inquisition. Everybody was on the side of, uh, of Galileo Galilei because, already because of his age and because of his scientific record and so on. So, so, but they dragged the old man in there, they showed him the torture instruments, they never tortured him, but they showed him the instrument and, and he was not martyr material and <coughs> who wants to be tortured? It's one of the most horrible things which a man can do to a man. And uh, so he rescinded, but not uh, in a convinced way. And he murmured in his beard there, and it turns anyway. So it was the question if that thing on which we sit there, if this is turning or not. And it appears that it does not turn. It seems to be very stable. But if you describe what we are doing here in quantum physics, going out the door there, you are walking on waves. So that means what science tells us and what, we, what appears to us Science tells us always the opposite of what appears. So people still say, honey, look how beautiful the sun rises in Lake Michigan, nothing rises whatsoever. So, so 400 years already. So the, the language is very conservative and stays back behind what, what is really the case. So <coughs> and Galileo, uh, the way he behaved, he somehow provoked that in a certain way. He said to the inquisitors, you are children you are stupid, sit on your ass and do some studying, look through the, through the telescope and so on. So, and of course they had the power and it's not very good to challenge the power when one, and they have the torture instruments, so uh, that's, but uh, be, behind that there was um, the argumentation of course of Galileo was a scientific one. Um, he, uh, by the way, that had been taught before that the earth turns around the sun in Bologna and everywhere. But the, um, what the Inquisition said, and that was reasonable, that was he should sharpen his lenses further and he should develop his mathematical formulas, which others had taught too, um, more in order, to, uh, in order to see that the theory was really substantiated. That is a fair requirement. Now, uh, Galileo thought that his lenses were sharp enough and the mathematical formulas and that he had enough evidence for it. But you can always ask, like you have it in the case of Einstein and so on, he had the formula, but they were still, they had to go to Africa and elsewhere in order to see, uh, you know, what the constellation of the planets were. And that happened only at a certain time. And uh, so <coughs> it took uh, years and years until what Einstein had already by mathematics made clear. Um, that space is spending and time is spending and, and so, but it took so long in order to get the evidence. So that was really the issue and that is a serious issue on both sides. Also, the Inquisitors um, had another issue and that was they wanted to defend the faith as far out as possible. And that means that they had an inkling of what was coming. That means if they lost the battle in the cosmological realm, it would slowly move into the biological realm and it would then go into the economic realm and it would then go into the psychological realm and then the whole faith position would shrink and would become smaller and smaller and smaller. So uh, that was um, a, a realistic type of a fear. <laughs> they also did not know how to tell it to the people because the New Testament here and the, the Hebrew Bible and the Holy Quran, they are all written in the Ptolemaic model. So the sun is rising and uh, the sun is sometimes even standing there while the Israelites are battling and that sets a little bit later and uh, all these things. So the, and now they had to tell people it wasn't that way. The sun was not rising and was not setting. <coughs> and then they were afraid and that's always the fear of the popes, of all the seven popes, because you have, we have only one in the west, right? There are seven in the east, so there's the Pope of Alexandria and then of Moscow and so on. So, 
Stalin put in the Moscow Patriarch. So, so that means he is only the Westerner. The others are the Easterners of the Orthodoxy. And the split occurred in the year 1000 between them, but he is not, is not alone, so he's one of a group there. So, <laughs> nevertheless, this, um, uh, so we can, the best way to settle that reasonably is to see the argumentation on both sides. <coughs> they were afraid that the people could lose their faith because they suddenly changed the, the paradigm. Um, they were afraid that if one would allow the scientific enlightenment, it would move from the cosmological into the, into the psychological sphere, and um, that really happened then, and that would weaken the faith further. Um, so, um, and Galileo had this, if, if they could, things could have been done differently, that it didn't happen differently, and uh, the uh, quake happened uh, also in art, the Renaissance people, the, suddenly read old documents of antiquity, and so it was a massive type of a movement in which that quake started. And it only started because from then, from Galileo to Newton to, uh, uh, to, to Darwin and to Spencer and to Marx and to Freud and so on, it went deeper and deeper and deeper. So, and uh, then always this childlike thing, you know, now we have discovered something new, and now the split is healed, and people have this longing because it's painful. The split is painful on the personal level. If every question comes up, premarital sex, divorce, uh, 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 stem cell research, or whatever, homosexual, whatever, at every moment that split occurs again, and you have the orthodox position, you have, let's see, the, the grand-grandmothers of my students, they all thought like Benedict. But then the mothers, they said, well, you should not have birth control, but sometimes you need it. You shouldn't have a divorce, but sometimes you are needed and so on. Now those who sit before me, they don't even understand anymore what the grandmother was all about. Not even their mothers they understand any longer. So you see how the secularization process moves on and on. And of course, one can have the longing that the reconciliation and harmonization would take place, but it has to be has to be realistic, because otherwise you will be disappointed again. So whenever in the natural sciences something is the big, big bang, so they say, now it fits, you know, now the, the big bang means God has created the whole thing. But the man who did this, the priest, Mercier, who invented or discovered the big bang theory in the 40s, was a Catholic priest in Belgium, and he wrote to the Pope Pius XII that he should not use his new theory <coughs> in order to support Genesis 1 and 2, or John, the first, John chapter, the first chapter, so, because it is a completely different type of a way of thinking, of language, and so on, and the split continues, therefore, and it will continue with the new things about brain mapping, and, and so on, and so on. It will go deeper and deeper, and so if, um, uh, what rules we will develop in order to get this together, one thing is for sure, that if Galileo has enough evidence, if Darwin has enough evidence, then the faith position has to be changed. It is absolutely hopeless to go on and on and on, and like Benedict does once more, well, the Inquisition was right after all, and so on. And so of course, you know, uh, the whole uh, universe broke down on him then, and uh, this pressure, I think, is while he suddenly felt that he was too old and, and fragile, just didn't go on anymore. And now, does that help us to have a better prognosis? <laughs> no, unfortunately not. Because the question is, the next guy whom they will bring up next week or whatever, um, must come from the cardinals. And the cardinals, the predecessor of Benedict, already replaced half of them with conservative guys who look exactly like them. And this one replaced the other half, and they also look like them. So they have to vote now. It's not so that there are not some people out there who are neither patristic nor scholastic, but are Christians who can think in a modern way, uh, for instance, who would address the most uh, rigorous problem there is, and that is the problem of the classes. That means the problem of poverty, and here we come to that having 
of being. Right? So while I think that Benedict Joseph Ratzinger was in, a man of integrity and a man of being, really, and not of having, and so on, that by diplomacy or whatever it was, it, he let himself to be induced to, uh, or seduced to uh, side with the uh, um, capitalistic ruling class in Central and Southern North America and so on. Uh, that was uh, that was against this. Uh, because they are convinced, and there is no real basis. The only thing where Jesus talks about it is. Uh, uh, of that people who are divorced should not marry again uh, and they should be eunuchs for the kingdom's sake. Jesus thinks of people who are eunuchs biologically and they are eunuchs psychologically and sociologically and then they are eunuchs out of theological reasons but these were people who were married, who had a family and so on and then uh, would not marry again. So. That is, and, and it was nowhere applied to clergy or whatever. That happened only in the year 1000 by Gregory, who was a monk. So it meant that they made the whole clergy into a monk business. So on one side, they do not have an oath of obedience, they don't have an oath of poverty, uh, and uh, they don't have an oath of, uh, of, of chastity neither. So it is some kind of a mixture between a secular position, secular priesthood or whatever, and, and uh, the uh, monasticism, which uh, should be cleared up and should have been cleared up a long time ago. So, uh, nevertheless, this, uh, um, so the, the uh, I, I wouldn't, I didn't bring that up, the child abuse, because I don't think it is so much in, in the foreground and that this is really what, uh, what brought him down. Um, what brought him down is that he wanted to use, after the collapse of the Thomistic, um, uh, Thomistic paradigm, that he tried to replace it by a patristic one, and it worked even less. So out of this we should uh, draw the conclusion, you know, that we have to uh, move into modernity, we have to learn to think like modern people do, and we have to accept a new logic, and the man who produced that was a Protestant, uh, Protestant theologian, philosopher, and that is Hegel, H-E-G-E-L, we mentioned him already, the teacher of Marx and so on, who according to Karl Barth should have become the Thomas Aquinas of the Protestants, and I have always added he should also have become the Thomas Aquinas of the Catholics as well. And to today I would also add that the Islamic brothers and sisters, in order to to make a paradigm change, not only into modernity, but also post-modernity, that they need to have uh, made contact with their own philosophical background again, which the Sufis and the lawyers repressed early on. And without having a philosoph philosophy, you cannot make change. The only reason why there was change in the West in recent uh, two centuries or so is that they had philosophers who helped them to think through and to make a step further. So since 1917, we are in, uh, we have left modernity behind and we are going into a postmodern type of a paradigm and that was prepared by, uh, by thinkers and Metz and Kung and so on, took that over. So therefore, a uh, the great thinker, the greatest thinker of the bourgeoisie, Hegel, could very well help them to get out of this mess now. <laughs> but. Um, and behind Hegel there is, of course, there is uh, uh, Master Eckhart, as we mentioned already. <laughs> and Master Eckhart is still, there is a papal decree which excommunicates him and so on. And Ratzinger did not do anything in the last seven years, neither anything about this and so on. <coughs> and uh, he embraced the, the Pope of Alexandria, but then they kiss each other, but that's about all. There's only one thing he would have to say, and that is, uh, we, in Rome, we are um, one with all of you, a, a primus inter pares. I am the first among equals. But we all patriarchs, eight patriarchs, we are all equal. But I am the first. And they would have all agreed to it. And also the Archbishop of Canterbury would have agreed. But he doesn't <coughs> say that. He could not say this. But he says, I am the first among unequals. And that is unacceptable for all the other patriarchs. They would accept that Rome played an important role because Peter has been there 
And all the councils which took all place in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, they always, when the Pope didn't come himself, they sent a message to him and they put the documents before his eyes and he had to sign up to them and so on. So the Western Patriarch, uh, who is always a little bit strange guy, because when the uh, Roman, West Roman Empire collapsed, then the East Roman Empire in Constantinople was supposed to protect the territory over Ravenna. They had an extra shot in Ravenna, but they were too weak. So when the barbarians, my ancestors there, marched into Italy, then they couldn't stop it. And so when Attila came, uh, the Pope had to meet him in the Piava River on this little white horse, and they talked with each other. Nobody knows what they talked, but Attila turned around and he went back to the Danube and celebrated his wedding and got a heart attack in the wedding night. So they had to defend themselves, and so that is why the Western uh, Patriarch became so powerful, also in a secular way, and has this unbelievable self-consciousness. And because of that build up, that is why Bishop Bradley said that it was so courageous, uh, because it took something, you know, to, to make that decision, I'm quite sure. And, um, and that should be deeply respected. And as far as the voluntary thing is concerned, that he did this also voluntary, the popes of the 14th century, 15th century, who resigned, and there was not only one in the beginning, but there were others later on, at least four or five resigned, but they all resigned because they were forced. They were forced to resign by the council. That means at that time we had that what is conciliarism. The council was above the pope. And when the popes competed with each other, there were sometimes three popes or so, then the council would depose all three of them. Uh, so powerful it was. But the councils in modern time have been delegated back, relegated back to a rather weak position. And so this pope did not resign because of the council. There was no council. We need a, a second council in Jerusalem uh, in order to settle all these uh, horrible problems which are accumulating. But there was no council which forced him. What forced him out was an other informal uh, opposition in all, on all continents against him because of his conservatism, which was rooted in the, pat in the patristic, in the church father's ideas in which he grew up. And uh, one specific thing was, he fought in these seven years and before already, he fought the dehellenization of Christianity. And uh, just one word, I'll explain that a little bit. We read the first chapter, first of all, the New Testament which we read that was written in Greek. So, and it was a bad Greek. Uh, it was Politan Greek. So, like bad English is spoken on the north side here. It was this type of Greek which, in which the New Testament is written. Therefore, for 500 years, no professor of the University of Athens converted to Christianity already because of the low level of, of Greek there. So, um, so that is nevertheless the New Testament and the Greek uh, spirit and civilization, that means Hellenism, was very strong, and it is not like connecting Christianity with China or with India or whatever. The uh, Greek thinking, like the Logos, who was with God and was God and so on, that is all Greek thinking. And the uh, Jewish people in Alexandria already made that marriage with the Greek civilization, and so, um, therefore, the Pope, uh, if you take the Greek element out of it, it becomes a very nice story like Socrates. It becomes a story about a heroic person who fought the state and was executed and so on. But uh, the whole high Christology about the Father and the Son and the Spirit and all this would all go. So, uh, therefore, he fought for Hellenization. But the modern world de-Hellenized all the time. So the Reformation was already de-Hellenization. That means Luther rejected the Aristotelian and the Platonic uh, interpretation of the New Testament. He thought that human reason is a whore. You can use it for all possible, it brings up possible reasons for the worst things and so on. So um, that was the first push of de-Hellenization. So therefore, 
he had trouble with the Protestants. So when he came to Germany, he did not really talk with them. He did not embrace them uh, lovingly in the last visit. And Protestants were very disappointed. He did not go to Eisenach and, um, and to the places where, where Luther uh, translated the Bible and did not really recognize them. So, But then the second wave of dehellenization is the bourgeois enlightenment of which we are the result here. Uh, so then, uh, and the third one is the uh, multiculturalism now. So therefore he alienated himself from the Reformation, he alienated himself from the bourgeois uh, type of, uh, of liberalism, and he alienated himself then also from multiculturalism in which our youngsters are involved and so on. And this was simply too much. The donkey could not carry all this. Was it of his own doing? Well, this is not a personal thing. These are decisions which concern the whole uh, uh, church and where, where we want to go. Um, so one cannot blame him for all of this. Uh, but we know that, that what he was pushing, this patristic model, and because of which he was called to Rome in order to stabilize things, that has failed. And this is what one has to see now in this election of the new pope now that one does not get another one who pushes the, either the scholastic thing or the patristic thing, but somebody who has the courage, and that would be real courage, to accept, you know, uh, uh, let's see, for instance, the thinker Hegel, who was the greatest theologian of the 19th century and the greatest philosopher ever. There are many people who hate his guts, particularly in this country, but nobody would ever deny that he was the greatest in the field of philosophy which we have ever seen. And that makes also his system so difficult, and it takes an unbelievable type of work to get through it. But, and we have decided in the Great Depression here to reject his logic, because we thought that people would, if people would think dialectically, they would be destabilized. We had already the economic destabilization uh, which the New Deal could not really deal with, and the Second World War dealt with it. And now we have the same problem. We have, again, the last speech of the President was a New Deal speech again. It will not balance, it will not stabilize economically. But people were afraid that on top of this uh, economic destabilization, we would also have one in our mind when our students suddenly would think dialectically, which means they look at Kalamazoo and they look at the railroad station and on one side they have these 10,000 or whatever people on the north side and on the other side they have people who have um, million dollar houses with police watch and so on and so on. So it is this unbelievable antagonism and one is rich because the others are poor and the poor are poor because the others are rich. The one inherits the surplus value and the other one inherits the loss of the surplus value. That is why they remain poor all the time, and while the rich remain and inherit it, it's both inherited, the poverty and the wealth is inherited. So when on, on campus when they write a dissertation, they can write about the rich and the women in the swimming pool and they become neurotic or whatever. They can also write a dissertation on the other side, on the north side, if they want to. But they cannot write a dissertation in which they bring both of them together, because dialectical thinking means thinking in in antagonisms, in contradictions, and how these contradictions should be resolved. And when you talk about this, then we have to ask how we can get beyond our present situation, because no matter how rich civil society became, and how much more having, 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 and so on, they never got rid of the slums. Every American city, Kalamazoo and Chicago and Detroit, where the killing takes place, and so on, Every city has its slums, which is 40 million people altogether. So, um, and, and it, it is structurally there. If, um, if you don't have the Irish sitting there in the Kalamazoo slum, then you have the blacks in there. And if the blacks move out, then they have Chicano sitting there. Always somebody has to sit there. That means the structure does not change. And what the president did again in the State of the Union is to invite people from the fourth estate to come over and join the middle class the third estate. Now, if you would get them all over, then you would have to ask who the hell is doing the work, because it's the fourth estate which does the work. So, uh, so the, not all of them can come over. So he, even the president does not want to do away with the fourth estate. 
He just wants to give the opportunity, the freedom of opportunity, that some of them, like he himself, can go from, or Clinton, can go from the fourth estate to the third estate, which is a very nice thing, but it does not change the class antagonism as such. So this type of thinking, you know, or that we have, uh, that the fourth estate has no representation, that all representatives and all senators are the third estate. And that so therefore when the president says, you know, we go up to nine dollars uh, minimum wage, that is a present which the third estate makes to the fourth estate. And the CEOs, you know, three million to whatever a month, and they cannot give this one dollar more to the guy who watches the door or whatever. I mean, this is, you know, this is the insanity to which dialectical thinking would make people aware of this. And if you don't have the categories, you cannot see anything. See, if I take students to Jerusalem and they have not read before anything about Jerusalem, they see nothing except the birds. So you have to have categories like the surplus value. If you don't have that category, you go into a restaurant and you say, well, what does she get? 250 and then some tips and so that's good. But you see nothing what's going on in the reproduction of the society. So um, therefore they repressed the dialectical thinking and then paid a horrible price because in Vietnam we had General Giap who was a dialectician and Westmoreland didn't know where the hell he was. And with the Ba'ath Party in Iraq, it was the same thing. They had uh, also a dialectical uh, education from the Russians, from General Shukov. So, and so it goes all through the Near East now, and we lost the war also in Iraq, and we lost it also in Afghanistan, and in Vietnam, and so on. And all the people who died, if you have a positivist on one side, like General Paulus in Stalingrad, and you have Shukov on the other side, who is a dialectician, the guy who has this positivistic outlook, he will lose. And even if he has more tanks, he will lose. If he has more airplanes, he will lose. Because dialectic thinking means, like General Giap did, he pushed forward and made an attack, like say the threat offensive or whatever, and then suddenly he disappears again. That means he comes with a certain theory and then he makes experiences, goes back, transforms the theory, and with a transformed theory he makes a new attack. While he is withdrawing, then comes McNamara and says, we won, we won. And then suddenly they stand in the middle of Saigon. And then they say, McNamara, you are a liar, you are a liar. No, he's not a liar. He's just a positivist. He cannot think dialectically. He cannot think what his opponent does. So then suddenly they, they are withdrawn after the Tet Offensive. They're all gone again. And suddenly they stand in, the, in, in, in Saigon and force us to, uh, to protect our retreat and so that they didn't shoot us to pieces while we were leaving. So um, this is the price which we paid for it. So we, we repressed this new type of logic because we thought it destabilizes and something similar has happened in the church as well. The clergy whom you see there, Bradley and so on, they have no idea about uh, what direct thinking would mean and what, what the reading of the New Testament would be like if one would apply that and the church history and so on, it would be a completely different view and they do not have the courage. The, 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 the greater courage would not be to resign, the greater courage would mean to make a paradigm change and not to go back to the church fathers and not go back to the scholastics. And if that because of the election they get another one in who does either of the two, the crisis of the church will only deepen. Hans Küng has just written a book, Can the Church Still Be Rescued? And he said to me, I said, I, I didn't want to write it. I didn't want to write it, but I had to. There's another thing. The Ratzinger uh, took away from Küng the venia legendi. That means the right to teach as a theologian. That was on Christmas 1978. And all this time, he was not able to remove that or to have some adequate talk. He met with Küng in Bavaria and also in Castel Gandolfo. They could not meet him in the Vatican because he was under heresy con uh, suspicion and so on. And so nothing moved, nothing moved. And one crisis after the other. So if they get another one like this and he's younger, then the catastrophe will, will be complete. Thousands of Catholics have left in Germany and here and so on. And that will continue. So that is the, um, you know, that is, but 
there is another aspect which I want to tell you. Last time, last year, we talked about the entrance of religion into the public sphere. Here you have a piece there, right? They called up, quite like me, and we entered the public sphere. It is unbelievably difficult, you know, to get that straight with, um, with an, uh, I, I talked a whole hour there to her, and that is all what she came up with. Um, not because she's a good journalist and so on, but um, the sophistry which is at work in the, uh, the, uh, the argumentation process and so on is so messed up that in order to get a controversy like this about the resignation of the Pope, to get that through in an honest and truthful way is unbelievably difficult. Not only did I have to spell out every word which I said and so on, but I repeated things. 50 times and so on, and she really tried hard, and she scribbled it down and, and so on, and comes up with a relatively poverty-stricken type of a thing. Now, um, the, um, he was a fellow of theology and troubled with the youth, well, yes, I think we went to this, but Bishop Bradley said the Pope took a deliberate approach, what does that mean, deliberate approach? Of course he took a deliberate approach, it has no content, the, the whole thing, deliberate about what? It is just the formality, the whole thing. So a Catholic should not be a formalist. That's what the secular people do. They're all formalistic, but the formalization of Catholicism is in itself a sickness, which one could talk about. So the, uh, but Bishop Bradley deliberate about in leading the Catholic Church and didn't miss a beat. He missed every beat he could possibly <laughs> miss. So um, what is this? That is what is called Pope mythology. They mythologize the Pope. Now, there are a lot of good souls and um, who, who like this, and and maybe one should do it sometimes. I'm not entirely sure, but I am very much uh, uh, deeply impressed, you know, because I, I come from Polytan background. I come from the fourth estate, and if I had not had good priests, well-educated priests, I would never have gone wherever I wanted to go. So I'm very grateful to them, and, and the church uh, uh, that they are, that the church is present in the fourth estate. Maybe the only ones who are really present there, not only inside of the Kabbalistic nations, but also in the so-called third world or fourth world or whatever, where you have it's worldwide the whole antagonism between the poor and the rich. So, um, so, so I don't know if that is really necessary, you know, to do this mythology. And he, but traveling around the world and writing extensively doesn't mean much neither. He made note that the Pope announced the resignation on the day of the feast of Our Lady of Lourdes and the World Day of the Sick. What in God's name does that have to do now with the resignation? Lourdes is not a, a necessary belief. It's not a dogma. So therefore Catholics don't have to believe it if they don't want to, and most don't. So the same thing, we have something else there in Metagorgy, where we go, they, we went together, we two there, Metagorgy, the, the youngsters who saw Mary and she talked to them and she still goes on talking with them, but the bishops have turned against it uh, in Metagorgy and uh, the church is careful about this, it wants to have people's uh, faith strengthened, if that's what it does but they want to be truthful all the time. It took a long time until the bishop accepted Lourdes, and they never accepted metagogy. There's business involved in metagogy. It became a huge metropolis with buses and money and banks and all over which the poor Mary never thought of, and not in her wildest dreams. So <laughs> this is a, and, and then there is the business, the buses, buses, who bring all these people from Rome and so on. That's a huge business. And so to, now the Franciscans who um, have this place now, and I, one, of, one of them is my friend or so, uh, he doesn't believe a thing, but he thinks it's good uh, that people have this Mary talking to them. The longing in a society which has become totally imminent that something transcendent breaks through is so great. And when something like that happens, then people go to communion again and they go to confession and the Franciscans uh, justify all this, you know, it does a good thing, but there's still the question if it's true or not. One cannot get around this question ultimately. So, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the Pope's resignation that this was Lourdes or 
World Day of the Sick. Because he was not sick, he just uh, mentioned it once more that he is not sick. He is not sick at all. He is just old and it is too heavy what the donkey has to carry. <laughs> so uh, he also said that the Pope was well over age of retirement when he became the pontiff of the age at 78. Well, he knew this, right? <laughs> and he was over age, so he could have resigned himself already at that time and go into a little room and write nice books. Mm -hmm. he, by the way, he wrote two volumes on Jesus uh, in the patristic style and so on. So, well, that's nice. A lot of people like them. Lourdes is a place in France, well, that's good, where people 150 <laughs> years ago went, went to bathe in special waters exactly. for healing water. Yes. Bradley said the fact that he recognizes his own human condition, his limitation as he, his role as Holy Father today is important. Now this Holy Father is very problematic. The um, John Paul II, the journalist, came and said, uh, Holy Father, you should not really call yourself Holy Father because, as we just read, where Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only one is good, your Father in heaven, etc. Jesus also says, don't call anybody Father because you have only one Father, your Father in heaven, etc. But, yeah, the Pope said, well, he said, well, yes, that's in the New Testament, but we have done it so long, so <laughs> why should we stop it now? I mean, this is not a very good argument, neither. You know, so, and, and recently, Ratzinger did make, make a change. He found out that there were no donkeys in the, in Jews, in the Nazareth there. When, you know, there is only, it's only, in the New Testament says something about a place, you know, where animals could be, but no animals are mentioned. No sheep, no cows, or whatever. So, for a moment, the Pope demythologized the, um, the thing there, in, and, and everybody was sad. Even the anchor man said, you know, I like the little sheep and donkeys <laughs> more than anything else. It was St. Francis of Assisi, which invented this, by the way. Since him, we have that little quip there, and I went to Jerusalem and I bought one there from Christian Arabs, and I gave all my family, they all got a little one, and so on. It's really nice, and I had it last Christmas. I simply didn't obey the demythologization. I put all the little camels up there, they all fall down all the time, but I all put them up in the little sheep and no Jesus can be seen anymore, he's so tiny and all these big camels around and so on. But this is, I mean, this is popular type of uh, Christianity which should not be underestimated. It is a good thing, you know, the, um, the uh, fabrication of legends. Uh, somebody told me that I got one of my PhD guys there, he read something about Jesus' diary. <laughs> somebody, made, somebody made up Jesus' diary from day to day and so on. So, the, the, why, why not? I mean, so there, there are beautiful stories in Holland, for instance. All the Dutch guys come from here. And uh, so they put Jesus right into the Dutch landscape. <laughs> and he, he looks Dutch, he doesn't look dark like a sea mite with a good. Dutch Aryans sitting there. So, so, I mean, all that makes some sense. If one knows what, is, what one is doing, then it's okay. But because I have so many students who come from Detroit, from a Polish family, and they are so fed up with all this, then it becomes really dangerous. But if people take it the right way, then this type of popular uh, Catholicism, we would say, sometimes people say vulgar. Marxism, uh, so then they could all the same vulgar type of Christianity, but it's a bad word. In Islam, so, they call it the riffraff. Okay. Riffraff Islam. Yeah, right. uh -huh. but I, I, By the way, it's 22 if you want to put the video on. Okay, very good. So I just want to finish that up here. So that was in Lourdes there, and Bradley said Benedict is also aware of a need for a new evangelization, right? That is good, but how are you doing this, right? When we look around the world, a common factor we find in the U.S. and in other parts of the world is there may be a decline in people's awareness in God himself. You may be sure, dear Bradley, there. The new Pope will be very attuned on how we can be teaching the faith and proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Already this type of a language is not the adequate language. You don't have a, a Europe or an America where they are all running away. That is different from what they did in antiquity 
when they converted other people. The evangelization is now addressed to nations which have rejected Christianity. That's a completely different picture. And uh, one can see that only when you can think dialectically and see the whole stream there, then you'll see that it is a completely different story to talk to a Roman citizen who had never heard of Christianity or to a Germanic tribesman drinking beer at the Rhine River and the Danube and you want to convince him. It took him centuries to get it through his brain there. And, uh, but now you have people who are educated to a large extent and on educated grounds and the wrong ones too, um, they rejected it. And so what are you doing with them now?